this isn't being recorded, which I should be recording this. I've only missed the first part. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, the, the excavations at Ur themselves revealed some finely crafted objects, um, vivid indications of a residential and noble past. Also vivid indications of something else that we've never come across in any of these lectures on, on this scale. Number three, point number three, human sacrifice. Human sacrifice on a vast scale. Hundreds of people being buried with the kings and queens of the Sumerian landscape. Of note also could be said, um, and, and uh, somebody said that they, they had been, again, one of these things that they'd watched a program on, uh, and I thought, great, why can't I do lectures that, uh, that people just haven't heard about the subject. Anyway, I, I was told that um, the archaeologist um, said that the reason why we're getting large numbers of human sacrifices associated with the civilization of Ur is quite clear because people believed that the afterlife was a far better life than the life they were leaving on this planet. So, you know, this is, this is extreme. You know, you, you would willingly give your life with your children um, to in the service of the king and queen because you believed that the afterlife was far better than the life even the kings and queens were living. So you would give yourself. And that was, that was one conclusion um, that this program actually made, I was told. So there he is again, Wally, um, one of those great archaeologists of the past, one of those archaeologists of the past um, that really did things in the right way. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna grab, um, I'm just gonna get um, another screen up on my computer. So if you can bear with me a minute. Um, um, anyway, I really, I really appreciate um, wonderful Ellen telling me that this wasn't re being recorded. And it's so good to get these things recorded um, because obviously if you miss things, uh, you can actually watch them again. So, Leonard Woolley, he's not only an archaeologist, he's, he's, a, he's a star. He's a star of archaeology. And I know some of you may have seen images of this. Um, we're not going to go on a complete diatribe about my relationship with Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi regime back in 2002. We've already done that with the other lecture. But I, if, if the war hadn't um, taken place, I would have been working in the museum um, that held these golden artifacts. Um, and it's an opportunity that um, obviously was taken away from me by the illegal invasion of Iraq. But this itself is, is they, what they've got, they've got um, golden bulls and golden goats. Um, and this itself is, is one of the notable discoveries from the excavations at Ur. And we'll, we'll look into what this is <coughs> towards the end of the lecture. But, but again, um, the discoveries there um, are amazing beyond words. Now, I know Ellen's going to put a note up on the screen where exactly is it. What I'm, what I'm doing at this moment is still keeping this landscape a little bit of an enigma. And then I'll show you exactly where it is. So going back to um, what we're going to do, we're going to go through to these points um, in detail, really residential neighborhoods, kings and queens, and the human sacrifice, and obviously the prehistory bit. But um, my notes in front tell me that the prehistoric discoveries at Ur are far more important than even the golden artifacts that were discovered. Because the, discover the prehistoric discoveries at Ur have even more meaning than actually them being prehistoric layers. I've already indicated what that could be. So the earliest traces of human occupation between the great river uh, Tigris and Euphrates, uh, creating um, between them a, a, a valley, um, the Mesopotamian landscape, um, you know, the great worlds of Mesopotamia. Um, and the information that Woolley offered us was that particularly at Ur, we've got archaeological evidence saying that people lived at Ur, for over 
five and a half thousand years. So again, repeat, five and a half thousand years, people lived at the locality of Ur, which makes it the, the oldest, or if not one of the oldest, um, um, urban occupied areas on the planet, it continuously occupied. The site seemingly abandoned at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. So we're going back to 7,500 years ago to the birth of Jesus Christ. So that gives us um, 5,500 years that people lived at that locality. Prehistoric evidence of villages. Evidence as well of early painted pottery. Um, and this is, this is some of the earliest pottery from such an early period to appear in archaeology. So we've got pottery going back thousands and thousands of years before we even believe that they were creating pottery. Also, as time would develop to about 5,500 years ago, um, we get the, some of the first written texts. And these written texts tell us so much about this landscape in lots of ways more than the archaeology could ever give us. Real written accounts of what people thought about their lives, what people thought about the myths and legends, what they were trading in, and so on. So these stories are with us 5,500 years ago. And when you look at 5,500 years ago, and you start to look at reconstructions like this, there's a reconstruction of the Sumerian landscape around 4,500 years ago. But this landscape's developing. If you think about going back again to 5,500 years ago, you only started to build small villages in places like Scarabray. Villages of about 10, 12, 15 houses. Not urban sprawls like this. Huge urban sprawls of thousands and thousands of houses temples, streets, um, palaces, um, plazas, um, shops, and so on and so on. So if you want, so in <coughs> many ways, the people of Mesopotamia are thousands of years ahead of the people of our country. And if you look at the reconstruction in front of us, you can see what is called the ziggurat, but we'll call it, for um, this case, uh, a stepped pyramid. Stepped pyramids don't just occur in Egypt. They occur in Indonesia, they occur um, in Central America, they occur in a number of localities on this planet. Step pyramids. And they're constructed not with the help of aliens, but they're constructed um, by these people that had determined their future, that had determined the direction that they're going to go into. And building step pyramids is a way to go. I know some of you have seen the um, um, program recently about the black pharaohs of the kingdom of Kush um, in um, the likes of um, uh, um, uh, southern, southern Egypt and beyond. Um, I know some of you have seen those programs and you'll see that the, you've got step pyramids there and you've got the mastabases. Mastabas basically is a, is a platform and then they thought, right, what we'll do, we'll put another platform on top of another burial, another platform, um, each time um, smaller and smaller, giving you the likes of these step pyramids. So by 5,500 years ago, these people were building elaborate temples, which they filled with exotic stone and metal objects interjection. Um, even though we know that this site, that the burials have been broken into and robbed over time, nevertheless, the gold that was left behind makes you wonder what was taken, what objects were taken in the past, far greater than the golden objects that you can see on the internet or in any other publications. But to us today in modern day archaeology, some of the finest golden objects ever found. At about this time, we see, um, we see the need to keep track of the complicated economic world that these people lived in. 
they needed to understand trade. They needed to be able to write it down. They needed to be able to write stories down about the kings. They needed to be able to write down myths, accounts, what's going on in the temples, um, what the priests are up to, um, boasting of deeds. Well, that's what we all do, isn't it? Boast of our deeds, but these people needed to write them down. So where these people had writing, before Cathy shout at, out at the screen, there's no substantial evidence to say that we had writing in Britain until the Romans got here in AD 43. But if you took me off in a quiet corner and asked me if there was writing in Britain before the Romans got here, I would usually personally say yes. But no substantial evidence. These people were known as the Sumerians. They laid the foundations of Mesopotamian, the Mesopotamian world. The Babylonians, the Sassanids, the Parthians, all those Persians, Cyrus the Great, even inspiring the likes of Alexander the Great thousands of years down the line. This site itself provided the foundation for the Great Museum at Baghdad, which was unceremoniously um, looted by American troops in 2003. Um, but most of the artifacts looted by the American troops have, have, have long since been repatriated, which is really, really good. Um, so the, lots of the golden objects that I tell you about that were found here are now back on display in the Baghdad Museum, which is great. And as you can tell from this lecture, I've got a lot of resentment against Americans for denying me an opportunity of going there. Um, so we've seen a little bit of a, an illustration, an artist impression of what this great city of Ur looked like. But let, let's just stop a minute. Um, the civilization that we call the people who lived at Ur was the Sumerians. Um, and their kingdom was the kingdom of summer without the M, Sumerians. So there was more than just one city of Ur. There was a number of cities. Um, depending on wh what you read, the word Ur in Sumerian could mean town or city or location, a bit like the word Lan in the Welsh language or Ton in the English language. Um, but the jury is out on that one, actually, even though we've got all these records. You've got Uruk, you've got the city of Ur, um, and other localities which have got the UR associated with them. So this may be an image from the 1920s, but the city of Ur itself was discovered in the 1870s initially, but um, they, were, they were poorly, um, the work was poorly undertaken, not a great deal was discovered, and excavations were abandoned. First World War interjects, and then we come in um, the likes of those, those people um, that we opened with. And one figure I need to remind myself of, um, if we go with this, Gertrude Bell. Gertrude Bell. So if we're going to put in Agatha Christie, we've got to put in Gertrude Bell. Gertrude Bell was the one who decided the borders um, of Iraq and Jordan. Um, she was the archaeologist. Again, Gertrude Bell, fam famous female archaeologist. She knew about the landscape and she was able to work out the ethnicity of the people, hopefully, to create the borders. Um, she got it very wrong and from that moment onwards, an archaeologist um, has caused all the trouble in the Middle East. There's nothing new there for archaeologists causing trouble. But a wonderful archaeologist, name drop in Gertrude Bell, name drop Max Maloan, um, who was the archaeologist who would eventually become the husband of Agatha Christie. Um, Agatha Christie, um, several of her no novels were based on the work of Sir Leonard Woolley at Ur and elsewhere. And there it is. There's our, there's our wonderful um, city of Ur. And you've got the river Euphrates. 
um, the river Tigris that goes through Baghdad. And very close to here would be the, the great arch of Sesifan uh, near Baghdad, but obviously much further south you've got Ur. So Ur is going to be one of those great trading ports and it would have been, it would have been closer to the Persian Gulf than it is today. So obviously with, with the rise of uh, water levels, large swathes of the landscape um, has actually been lost, but Ur is still with us today, the, the archaeology of Ur. Um, and it's thanks to the flooding of the Euphrates that the archaeological evidence that we get from Ur was covered, Ur was covered up, and that's what we find today. So in the 1920s, excavations revealed houses, palaces, temples, burial places, understanding burial practices as well, and understanding the wealth of these great people. The most famous of these excavations was actually at this locality under Leonard Woolley, 1922-1934, during which time he gained a comprehensive understanding of the city's history, going back in excess of 5,000 years. And again, its final abandonment at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Excavating a whole city quarter, revealing winding um, lanes, streets, courtyards. Um, and it's said that these would all lead um, down in unison towards the great ziggurat, which, which if you're looking, that is an image of the great ziggurat um, taken uh, by a reconnaissance craft. And that image behind me is one of 2,000 slides of the archaeological excavation of, uh, at Ur. Um, even though in the 1920s, 1930s, you know, there's not a lot of photography going on, Leonard Woolley illustrated his publications with 2,000 photographs. And this book in front of me, which is 250 pages long, he filled, he, in, in his collection, was 20,000 notes. So if you put those 20,000 notes in publications like this, you'd have a full library of his work at Ur. He was an obsessive note writer. He was an obsessive recorder of history. He, his wife, and his assistants would go in and do the work individually. Working at the excavations at Ur at one point was a staggering 300 individuals. Now, you don't get excavations of that scale today. An excavation with 3,000 individuals today, would, would the bill in wages would probably be set back a million pounds a day. But 300,000, 300, start again, 300 people working at that site, 300 with, with the archaeologists, uh, gives us an, an absolutely unbelievable scale of excavation work. The Great Ziggurat itself had been standing for many generations until the ziggurat that we see today, um, constructed around 4,100 years ago, um, a remodel displays the greatness of the Sumerian Empire. There it is, the great ziggurat, one, one of the, one, from one, one of the original plates. Now, uh, we, we'll see a few more images of this, actually. So what you see, you see, a, um, you see these steps, um, and you see um, a long ramp in front and two ramps on the side. Um, and this is all completely made of mud brick. Now... Because Woolley was very much into conservation, um, he decided that they were going to clad the outside of this wall um, with modern fired um, um, kiln baked bricks. Now, the mud baked, the sun baked bricks are in the core, and the kiln um, mud baked bricks are on the outside. So, obviously, you know, they, they, they give some protection against weathering. 
Um, there's evidence to say that this was slightly rendered over and it was painted, beautifully painted, beautifully decorated. Uh, it could be seen from miles around, poking out from the walls that surrounded this wonderful um, Sumerian city. Um, and this is one of a number of ziggurats across the Mesopotamian landscape. Um, they would have had ziggurats, ziggurats in most of their cities. It's known as the ziggurat of Nana, the moon god. Its full title is ziggurat of ur -Namun. The ziggurat or stage tower was first developed during um, around um, 5,000 years ago and became a standard feature of not just Sumerian cities, but Mesopotamian cities. Now, when you think about ancient Egypt, you think, you think pyramids. When you think of the likes of the Mayan civilization, you think of step pyramids. Um, we've got some background noise. Who's, who is it? I think it's Chris. Um, so, but... The, the, the standard for the um, Sumerian world and the standard for those, the Babylonian world as well, when you look at the, the likes of ne Nechabeneza, you get the, the, these, these great step pyramids, these great ziggurats. So that, that's what stands out from this landscape, um, these, great, um, these great ziggurats. Um, and not to bore you to death with my hatred of the American army, um, the American army... Um, substantially damaged the site of Ur um, um, in the um, invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, and, and again, the American army um, damaged large tracts of Sesophon, which is a bit of a shame, really. The, the only open areas for the Americans to park their tanks, they used Ur. Um, and we know that... Um, the museum at Ur was, was looted, again, by American troops. And we also know that um, substantially um, some of the unopened tombs were also opened and looted. Um, so recorded as well. Um, so, but back to, against, away from my great bugbear, um, this is a wonderful moment in archaeology. And there he is. Um, and if anyone thinks... In, in the images that we see of him excavating, he looks like um, King Edward. Um, but he doesn't look like King Edward in, in this moment. He, he actually had his wife excavating alongside him as well. Um, so she, she was a notable archaeologist. You see the likes of... Um, um, you see the likes of, of Flinders Petrie and his wife worked alongside him. You see the likes of Sir Mortimer Wheeler. His wife worked alongside him. I mean, they all became notable archaeologists. And so did... Um, Sir Charles uh, Leonard Woolley's wife look, work alongside him. Uh, but those archaeologists that stand alone as female archaeologists are those archaeologists like Gertrude Bell and Dorothy Gar Garrard and Kathleen Kenyard, Kenyon. So, and also you've got the writer Agatha Christie who's within the landscape recording some of this as well. So um, lots of these archaeologists live a, a good ripe old age, 1880 to 1960. Goff knew him well. And that's what we mean by the cladding on the outside. They had to do this. Because if they hadn't have done this, the wind would have eroded this site quite, um, would have had a catastrophic effect. And you wouldn't be able to understand it today. What all they've basically done is cladded the outside with, with these new bricks. Um, and if, say, for example, anyone wants to remove these bricks and have a good look at the temple, it's going to be there. You can actually... Um, you can actually look, you can actually see some of the um, mud brick, the original mud brick sticking out of the top there. Um, so you've got this ramp. It, this is easier to understand, actually, the way they've actually done this modern mud brick uh, facade on it to protect it. You can, it makes more sense. Um, I'm referring to this as a temple. Um, it, 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 it's very different from, say, the likes of an um, ancient Egyptian pyramid. Um, and say the likes of um, Pakal's great temple at Palenque, because Pal's, Pakal's great temple at Palenque is actually buried there. Um, but lots of, there are lots of these step pyramids 
within the Mayan landscape uh, that aren't used as burial chambers. Within the um, landscape of Sumerians, this is not a burial chamber. This, this, is, a, this is a temple. And then you can get an idea of, of, of the Bible and the temples, of, of, you know, the Temple of Babel and so on and so on. Um, and you can get an idea of the, um, the, the biblical connotation associated with the site. Lots of these ziggurats um, are built over um, much older ziggurats. They, they, they expand and get bigger and bigger. The visible um, ziggurat at Ur, um, was originally um, the work of uh, Namun, um, the temple associated with Nana, the moon god. Um, and the form of the ziggurat was modeled on a mountain and represented the abode of gods, and a god, actually. So the shape itself is modeled on a mountain. Not that I've ever seen mountains like this, but um, maybe this is what we're being told, and this is what this is. Uh, without reading the top left-hand corner of the screen, who is this very attractive guy on the left? And it's not me. No, that's not you, Goff, no. Even though you are very attractive, Goff, but it's not you. That Matt is... Hancock. What's that? Matt Hancock. No, that isn't Matt Hancock, no, but it looks very similar, no. That is T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Well, don't sound too enthusiastic. That, there he is. <laughs> Got a very big collar. I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> Um, but that, that is Lawrence of Arabia. He, he's there uh, with Leonard Woolley. You can see that Leonard, <laughs> Leonard just, just said, oh, he said, um, there was this Irish man, he bought a banana factory. He chucked all the bent bananas out. <laughs> uh, T. Lawrence is thinking, why am I here? But anyway, um, again, T. Lawrence and, and, this, this whole Arabian British thing, um, you know, the, after, the, after the First World War um, and the capitulation of the Ottoman forces, um, the landscape was divided amongst the French and the British. Um, and Iraq was given over to, um, under the mandate of the British authorities. And, and, and it meant actually that this British archaeologist was able to excavate at Ur without any restrictions. And that's exactly what happened. Not to, you know, criticize his work at all. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I'm, um, but that's why th he was able to excavate there, carte blanche, and was able to understand uh, and uh, excavate on a very large scale. You can imagine um, that you've got um, a Sumerian chariot um, and there is the enemy. Now, I, I felt that there was something interesting about this man on the floor. He's actually got the typical Mesopotamian beard, as we described um, last week with the um, Sassanids, and this typical beard and the sort of locks. Um, but the ones on the the ones on the chariot that don't seem to um, have the beard. Um, maybe they didn't need a beard when they were pulling the bow back. I don't know. But again, again, look at look at this. If you can, um, if you look around, um, if you look around, you can imagine the photographers going, right? I want a photograph of all the carvings, and this man's being a bit cheeky. He's putting his towel over uh, whatever this beast is, uh, and Sir Leonard Woolley's getting in the way of a chariot wheel. Um, but again, this uh, these artifacts. Uh, became the artifacts displayed in the um, Baghdad Museum. This, this, was, this was the first great collection in the Baghdad Museum. Obviously, you've got the excavations Nimrud and the Neve um, in the north. Um, and obviously, um, the work at um, Sesiphon and Uruk and, and other localities. But you can, you can, get, you can get why you know, this is in pride of place at Baghdad. Um, and, and a point that I did try and make but I didn't make enough of it. Um, the point being that 
when the likes of Gertrude Bell is establishing um, the Iraqi state, Gertrude Bell um, would have needed to offer the Iraqis an identity and the archaeological evidence that be, is being excavated by Leonard Woolley is giving the Iraqi people an identity. It's for once saying that actually the Iraqi people are a lot more um, than the Islamic faith, that's blasphemy in itself, um, are a lot more than the Sassanid Empire. They're a lot more than the Babylonians. In fact, they have a history in Iraq going back thousands of years and we can prove it now. And this, this is what gives the identity and this is why the artifacts are displayed in the Baghdad Museum. And it's the first lecture I've given where I'm struggling to hear my own voice because of the rain. <laughs> so here we go, we've got, another, we've got another map and you can clearly see on this map, Ur is actually closer to the sea um, because the Arabian Gulf has, you know, the water levels have ridden, risen and it's flooded the landscape and so on. And what you can see is that the, the empire of the Sumerians is more or less between the two rivers um, of the Euphrates and the River Tigris. And the residential street. We're into the residential street. And, and this itself, this itself, you, you can imagine, you can imagine if you squint your eyes, this is what the streets would have looked like at the time of Jesus Christ. But the next, the next thing I'd like to go on to is actually um, into the burials. And we, we, stop, we jump back and forth looking at the residential stuff, the burials and the temples and so on. But that is where we're going to go next. We're going here. And actually, we'll go on to that little inscription that we've seen in, in, in a short while. Now... Again, the way we're going to do this, we're going to look at the archaeology after the reconstruction. So, and this itself is a reconstruction of what the death pit looked like just before everyone in there was killed. Um, what, they, what they found excavating at Ur uh, was what was called death pits. Um, a large number of attendants, mainly women and male warriors, um, with oxen, would be placed into um, a rectangular pit in the ground. And there in the background is the burial of the king or the queen. And then these people, people would be, here we go, the scene in the royal graves at Ur, moments before the climactic acts of sacrifice and now represented only by the rows of skeletons and objects. But this evidence attests to the sea reed lines of ladies in waiting, soldiers, ox carts, and their drivers, and the oxen, if not to the imaginable thoughts of the victims and the rituals of the uh, officiants. Um, when when they when they found this, it was almost as if um, they, it was unbelievable what they were seeing. There was more than one of these uh, death pits. These famous tombs contained not just the the dead king or queens, but all these remains that we've mentioned. Apparently, these had been sacrificed to serve the dead royalty in the afterlife. The kings of Ur seem to have required a lot of attention. Unlike me, I never need any attention mm. at all. Mm. One grave contained 68 female and six male subordinates. Obviously, in this one, you've actually got soldiers associated as well. Laid out in rolls with their fine... Ro rolls? Laid out in rows with their finery, still ornamenting their bones... And in another grave, soldiers with their weapons and ox cart drivers and their animals guard the outer passage. 
while nine women with gold headdresses attend the burial chamber itself. And what we're going to do um, when we move away from these images, we will actually show you um, one of the golden headdresses. Um, and it's, it's actually spectacular. I haven't replicated this, but we'll show you on the screen. So we, we won't do that for a moment, but a little bit more about these burials. We'll move, go, we'll come back to all these images. Bingo. This isn't as good as the one I got in the book, but we're going to use this for a moment. So the, these are actually golden headdresses um, for um, the nine attendant women associated with one of the death pits. All of this burial structure, all of this burial ceremony, all of this burial finery befits a king or a queen. Although the royal tombs were robbed, the artifacts in many cases still remain. There was so much gold. The royal tombs were carefully examined by Sir Leonard Woolley himself. And he would excavate for four months of the year with his gangs over 12 years. Yielded some of the most celebrated pieces of Sumerian art and some of the most celebrated pieces of art we have ever seen done in gold. This is referred to as the standard of Ur. And the standard of Ur also being an object. And that object itself, we will go back into. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Beautiful. Actually, if we keep it there. This, so this being the standard of Ur and also this physically being the standard of Ur. This is a panel inlaid with nacre and lapis lazuli showing scenes of warfare and peace, going to war and peace. They also found, I actually don't know what nacre is. I didn't, I should have looked that one up. N-A-C-R-E. We all know what lapis lazuli is, the blue that, that, that is in the background there. Gaming boards, figures of a ram caught in a thicket and liars were ornamented with geometric designs and figure, figured scenes in the same inlaid technique of mother of pearl, carnelian and lapis lazuli. You can, the, the red is the carnelian on this one. The decoration of one liar made a visual joke by depicting a band of animals playing musical instruments. And I'll, I'll show you that again in the break. An electron helmet, an electron helmet. So um, an electron helmet, if I can remember right, is, is a mixture of silver and gold. Um, um, and this is the helmet of a king. King known as Mes Kalamdug. Um, and when we think about this, we get all this wealth surviving when in fact the tombs had been looted. And in that, again, the myriad of common objects, the word common objects, gold and silver jewelry, common objects. You need to think about that when these are common objects and you're thinking, Christ, there's so much wealth. Golden vessels, ostrich eggs inlaid with asphalt. Asphalt, another word for tar. Cylinder seals of semi-precious stones. Cosmetic containers. If I want to look something up, I can talk, talk it in now. What the hell was that about? Um, cylinder sea seals of semi-precious stones, cosmetic containers, and other goods nearly punctuated uh, the messages of riches and power. Messages from the past that have survived. But so much has been lost. And look at this again. In the first several hundred years, the dead kings of Ur were buried with elaborate rites in the royal cemetery. Let's go and have a quick look at the royal cemetery. And we come back to lots of this, actually. 
um, all these big pits in the ground. Bingo. Royal Cemetery. Look how deep this is. Up to 15 meters in depth, even more from the scale of this one. Over 2,600 graves were excavated. And, and that's, that's just the ones that were excavated. They didn't excavate all the kings. They excavated 2,600 graves of a population of tens of thousands of people. Some of these graves would contain the gold that we've just mentioned. Others would be some more of the common graves. One or two pots, that's all. Other burials of com commoners did contain greater riches. Commoners now. Metal weapons and tools, stone vessels, beads, and other jewelry of semi-precious stones, and other objects that had to be imported into resource uh, poor Mesopotamia. So in other words, what we're talking about is the resource poor Mes Mesopotamia. You're seeing lots of these goods being brought in, but they're great traders. The royal graves were subterranean chambers that we will see, often with vaulted roofs, and were entered through a ramp or a pit. Because so what we're going to do, we'll, we'll, we'll look at one of these, these tombs. And we'll come back to all these. There we go. That's what we're looking at. Um, entered through a ramp or pit, identified by cuneiform inscriptions. These were the tombs of the great kings and queens of Ur. Um, and lots of these date from roughly around 4,500 years BC, which is a thousand years before the, those, those leaders of Egypt that we know so much about, like Tutankhamun, uh, Akhenaten, and then we look at the, the Setis and the Ramesses. So these are a thousand years before the likes of the great leaders of ancient Egypt. And these had great burials. In fact, the richness of the burials here is far richer than any of the burials in ancient Egypt. But these have also been looted. So what would they have been like in the past? What would they have been like? What would have been in there that has been taken away? Um, and it does make you think. Um, one person mentioned about the, 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 the arch. The arch hadn't have been invented back then. So this is why we get these, these triangular... Um, these triangular arches, which make the ceiling much bigger than they should be. Um, and we didn't get the arch invented at this time either um, in Great um, in Britain. You don't get the arch in the likes of, of Orkney. You, you get the corbelin effect, where you get a, a much higher ceiling than you need. And this is what we get with the Sumerians. The arch, arch has actually been invented a lot later. Um, so what am I going to do? I, I'll, I'll go through a couple of these images. And then we'll have a little bit of a break. Give these images some more context. So there's the enemy walking up the steps at um, the ziggurat at Ur. Um, but you can actually see if the steps had been left the way they had been in excavation, uh, they would be badly eroded by now. So it was a good decision to actually clad the outside with these um, sunbreak uh, bricks. Um, uh, kiln baked bricks. The sun baked bricks in, internally, the, um, the kiln baked bricks um, on the outside. And that is a really nice re reconstruction. You can imagine um, the different tiers would represent different, maybe different tiers of people. Um, but that's, that's naturally just a guess. So you've, you've got, you squint your eyes and you're almost in, in Mayan. Uh, you're in, almost as in you're, you're in the Mayan world, uh, where you see these step pyramids, um, but no, you're actually thousands of miles away, and you're actually in Iraq. Uh, very finely built, and and lots of these ziggurats do survive today. You, what you've got uh, are these are these precinct walls, and then you've got the rest of the town, city, and so on. Uh, and it, it's it's all that it's all that thing with 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 these bricks. Um, somebody made a remark in the week, and I, I couldn't, I can't really put this into context. Uh, but the remark was, um, one archaeologist had said that people visiting these temples would bring some bricks with them. 
um, to help build another tier or to help build another temple. It was like an offering. Um, and if you've got a large population, it, it wouldn't take long for you to have hundreds of thousands of bricks to build other similar structures. But that's just an idea, right? Probably the way to work that out is, is to understand the differences in the bricks and so on. But, you know, that's another lifetime. Again, again, you're looking at the excavations um, at the ziggurat and you're going down and you've got the street scene and you've got some of the smaller buildings uh, and it looks very higgledy piggledy, but, but very intriguing the way uh, all this works and acts and has intercourse with each other. And the intercourse is very much to be seen uh, uh, with the ziggurat um, and with the walls and the houses and with the narrow streets and with the flat roofs, uh, almost, almost, almost Turkish looking today. You, you could probably go down some streets in some villages in Palestine that would look very similar to this. And it's quite a straightforward way of building small windows, um, um, normal sized doorways, um, flat roofs, you know, nothing much has changed. All to do with the temperature. Lots of trees growing amongst. Oh, I'll chuck in something else. You know, we've got um, archaeological evidence at, at Turkey to say that um, um, they they kept bees. Um, you know, on they kept beehives on the roofs of some of the buildings and within their gardens and so on. Um, I remember remember mentioning this, um, and we've got evidence and probably from Samaria as well. Um, and bees would indicate um, trees and flowers. So, well, they, they, you can't have bees without flowers and pollination. So, so that's a good sign that the landscape was fairly healthy. Lots of plants growing, um, the bees, um, fresh honey, all that type of stuff. Thought I'd chuck that in there. We've already seen this. Again, scenes of, of, of peace and fighting. And these great pits in the ground. Do you know what? I'd, I'd love to know what that thing is poking out there. What is that? Um, but they've left it in the excavation as they've gone down. And again, again, how many, image, how many black and white images have we got today? I think we've got about 10. There's, there's 2,000 of them. And, and there, there is Leonard. You can't miss the guy. He's always there excavating. Um, so... He's doing the archaeological work, which is not the same as some archaeologists at the time. Um, doing the dirty work. And I'm not going to mention some other famous archaeologists like Sir Mortimer Wheeler. And look at that there. Look at that there. Now, they came up with a technique um, for this wonderful object. Um, and it was... Um, if I can go to my notes, if I can remember where this is written to get this right. So what we're talking about is as, as he was excavating, um, he would do the Della, this, this is, this is a little miniature harp. Uh, as he was excavating, he would find the voids and some decayed wood and little bits of gold trappings. Um, and he come up with a technique uh, that involved plaster of Paris, um, and he, he would pour this into the space, um, and it would reconsolidate whatever wood was there, and he was able to lift it out of the ground. Um, and if he hadn't done this, we wouldn't really understand their musical instruments. We wouldn't really understand lots of the archaeology. Um, and it's so good that that he had these techniques at his disposal at his disposal back in the day. And back to this. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to show you this image um, and I'm going to cut the screen sharing. And I'm going to show you this. So um, what I'm just about to show you, I'll read, I'll read out what this says. Um, the skull of one of the attendants mentioned already, lots of attendants, but in one, one tomb you've got nine attendants with a headdress. Um, and the court attendants sacrificed to accompany their masters in death were also dressed in expensive finery when they ended their lives. 
Many of the women wore headdresses of gold and semi-precious stones brought from distant lands. And that's the description of that. So what you've got, you've got the jaw, you've got the lapis lazuli beads, you've got, these are actually um, birch leaf leaves, and you've got all the golden braiding in the hair, um, and you've got, this is just one individual. And if you compare this one individual with similar finds in Egypt, you start to realize that it's almost as if the Sumerian civilization could be far greater in wealth than the Egyptian civilization. And we've got so much more from Samaria um, over what's been found in Egypt, because much of what's been found in Egypt has been robbed. Um, and this as well, this is a very, um, the inlaid liar with golden bull's head. When Woolley found many of the delicate objects in royal tombs, the wooden parts had decayed, leaving the metal parts, stone and mother of pearl inlay and other durable pieces that were loose but in place. But careful preservation, he was able to reconstruct the form and decoration of many objects like musical instruments, gaming boards and inlaid panels. The front panel of the sound box of this lyre is decorated with inlaid scenes of animals and heroes. So basically the animals are mocking the heroes of the past and those scenes. So that there, and we've all seen that, I'm sure. And I don't know if anyone's actually ever been to the Baghdad Museum, but um, you will see these artifacts on display in the Baghdad Museum. So um, what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to take a break. And apparently I've got to, in the break, I've got to look at some a video and some pictures of Chris. Um, and I will do that for you, Chris. And right, uh, let's have some questions now. Um, Goff, anything you'd like to say? No, not the moment. Uh, what about you, Keith? Uh, Thank you. No, no, not really. I, I saw a program yesterday, I think it was, on the history of writing. Mm. And uh, they mentioned their Sumaria and uh, the cuneiform, and how it was a precursor to our modern alphabet, basically. So Sumaria was one of the first areas that actually started to introduce the concepts of writing. Yes, that's correct. Are you OK, Goff? You don't seem right. Okay. Um, You're okay. Okay. Um, have I asked you, Chris? You, yeah, I have, haven't I? So, um, no. Yes? No. No, I saw the same program that uh, Keith saw, actually. It was very yes. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ellen, one sentence, please. Anything? Yeah. Nakra is the mother of pearl on the inside of a shell. And you've got one. Yeah, I'm showing you now. Ah, right, the Nacra, right, thank you. The, the, it's Mother of Pearl, yeah. Right, okay. And then were the attendants in the mass burials buried alive or dead? Uh, they were, they were, they they were, were killed. all killed. They were killed, killed. Okay. And when were the kiln bricks put on the outside of the building? It was obviously after the Americans were there then. Well, mm. well, the, American, the pictures no. of the Americans, it looked all worn. Oh uh, no! They, those are the mud. Those are the bricks. Those are the kiln bricks. Oh, those were all right. Okay. Yeah, because if you look behind, it, the, the bricks are really degraded. So what they've done, they they've yeah. reconstructed the facade. That that was there. That was there at the time of the um, um, the Americans. Uh, Jane, anything? No, no, nothing from you, Jane. I'm muted. <laughs> She's muted. Okay, right. Let's have anything from Kathy and Ka oh, um, cool. Andrea. Uh, right, we've unmuted you. Yeah. <laughs> you got anything to say, Kathy? Yeah, we got nothing to say. Right, I'll need a word with you at the end, Andrea, as well. So nothing from from you guys. Uh, and Jim, anything? Um, <laughs> the women that were buried with the king. We're not getting it. We're not getting you. We can't hear you. We're not getting you. Uh, ask somebody else to mention. Just talk. Just talk. Just talk. Just talk. Just talk. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, were the women that were buried with the king, etc., could he part of his harem, maybe? 
Well, you would love to think that, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you would love, well, in Goff's case, definitely, but um, one woman's enough for me, you know? I, I wouldn't want more than one, no. That's just too much hassle. Um, okay, what we'll do, we'll have a break, but, you know, if a, anyone with Jane would be very lucky, wouldn't they, you know? So, um, okay, we'll, we'll have a break now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Coffee time. Uh, I think each week we should have a little score sheet. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> we see oh, yes. the end of the year. Oh, yeah. 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 How many different pronunciations for various words? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, so we're we're back to it. So, you know, I, I did I did think I did think long and hard about this lecture whether I was going to do the whole Sumerian civilization. I thought it'd be a really bad idea because um, what we needed to do we needed to see a snapshot of time, and this is what Agatha Christie wrote about the um, Leonard Woolley and the excavations at Ur, and. Leonard Woolley saw with the eyes of imagination. The place was as real to him as it had been in 1,500 years BC or a few thousand years later. Now she wasn't far off actually. She was a thousand years out, 2,500 years BC, but there was no radiocarbon data then. So it was rather in interesting of Agatha Christie. Um, and then she goes on to say, she goes on to say, wherever he happened to be, he could make it come alive. While he was speaking, I felt in my mind, no doubt, whatever that the house on the corner had been, whoever lived there. You know, he used to say that this was the house of, of Abraham, for example. And people used to believe it, you know. People, this, this was, Ur itself was a place that the Bible lived and breathed. Um, the story about the flood is believed to have been about the layers, which we'll talk about, the prehistoric layers that were buried thousands of years earlier uh, by the great flood. Um, it was his reconstruction of the past and he believed in it. And anyone who listened to him believed in it also. So that's Agatha Christie's own words. So we've talked a little bit before the break about um, um, the, the sub cuneiform script or the cuneiform script itself. Um, and years, we, I'll show a few images of it, but not too much, but you can make out an, a U and an R and a key. And that means this is the country or city of Ur. That's what that means. Ur, key being country. Um, the civilization of the Sumerians. So they knew who they were. They had a sense of identity. It's not just about temples like this and reconstructions. Um, but there's so much, there's so much about this one site that, that is, is the civilization. The reason why Woolley is excavating at Ur um, is that in 1922, he's approached by the British Museum and the Pennsylvania Museum. And they, they really want to have a site that nobody's worked on before, a really interesting site. And it was a perfect opportunity. This was 1922. This was a time that there was money available and funding available. And the excavations only stopped because there was the Great Depression in the 1930s. 1934 was the last year of the excavation. Woolley could have continued, but it's probably good that he didn't because they would, they would have needed four Baghdad museums with the, out, with the amount of material that was being found. Woolley wasn't just an archaeologist who had excavated in, in, in Ur. He had actually excavated um, at um, Nubia, um, working for the Italians, actually. They, they, one, of, one of the things I would say, there was great competition between, um, between nations in Europe. The Italians were excavating continually on Rhodes and Crete, and so were the uh, British working on Crete. Um, the French um, and the British were working in Mesopotamia. And when you look at um, Egypt, you've got great competition between lots of countries, including the damnable Germans. Um, by the way, I like the Germans. And you had the Americans, um, the damnable Americans working in Egypt. So you had all these nations, Western nations, 
excavating once in a bit of the past and actually a physical bit of the past but the archaeologists were actually saying no what we've really got here um, is more than the past so let, let's just look a little bit here so we've mentioned about what um, we've mentioned about um, the likes of Agatha Christie but we cannot lose sight of not just the Sumerians but the prehistoric um, the prehistoric evidence that he was finding. Listen to this. Um, the prehistoric evidence that he was finding dates this landscape back, you know, seven and a half thousand years ago. Um, the excavations of, in his words, flimsy huts and painted pottery. Painted pottery that marked the first occupation of Ur. Let's not do any more comparisons. Let's do, take a different angle now. These huts were buried beneath a thick deposit of river silt that seemed to match the story of the flood, recorded both in the Bible and um, the legends of Gilgamesh as well. So the flood, the flood, that very flood that we hear about in different texts. And then after that, very importantly, when, when we think about the burials, going through all those layers that you've got in front of you, deposits of garbage from the town was then built up upon these, this abandoned part of Ur. And then what happened was that in amongst all that garbage, for 500 years, that was the burial ground. And then the buildings, the urban area, expanded into that landscape. So we've got a great deal of change. Occupation, garbage, then we've got burial, then we've got living again. And you've got kings, the common people, buildings and, and so on. So in, in many ways, if you just want to look at the Sumerian world and just go to Ur, you can't do far wrong. Um, this was the period of the great digs. You know, they were all competing. So Mortimer Wheeler was eventually in the 1930s excavating, 1934 around there, um, excavating at Maiden Castle. You've got um, Gordon Child excavating, another archaeologist, uh, excavating at the likes of um, Scarabray. You've got Gertrude Cato Thompson excavating at Great Zimbabwe. So this is, this, and also Gertrude Bell, you know, you can't, can't miss Gertrude Bell, the excavations and uh, antiques of Gertrude Bell. And obviously you've got the, the, arch, the other archaeologist, Dorothy Garrard. To give a bit of balance there, archaeology is now becoming um, um, not a political um, um, science. It's becoming um, a science of both men and, and females and where the females can have one level of knowledge to history, the archaeologists are the male archaeologists are adding another level, but go, but um, Woolley was excavating uh, with a different mindset. He was excavating with a mindset that he really wanted to link in the common people with the rich and the rich with the common people, and then the, the burials and prehistory. He wanted to put it all together. This this, this period of the big digs a landmark landmark excavations landmark excavations would become the largest in iraqi's history um and we've mentioned the numbers of people involved in these excavations mm. so we're going to go back to this one i love this image actually um woolly exhumed thousands of bodies thousands of thousands of texts cuneiform text, Sumerian cuneiform text. And obviously what he's, what we're missing here is that above all that Sumerian stuff, you've got Babylonian stuff, you've got um, Nekabenezi, you've got all that, all that information to chuck in there as well. So, and all those different layers, 5,500 years worth of layers. Tens of thousands of complete artifacts, hundreds of thousands <coughs> of complete artifacts, registered artifacts. We're not talking about, you know, when I'm on an archaeological excavation, we've got a thousand artifacts found, right? But all of those are individual bits of medieval pottery or whatever, right? These are complete artifacts. You know, these are complete bowls, whatever they're made of. And the notes, the copious <coughs> notes he was taking. And 
20,000 pages of notes. Um, and the letters and reports he was making every single day. The ziggurat itself was the, um, the broadcast. Um, the, was the, would the ziggurat itself broadcasted uh, the Sumerian world. It, it was to say, this is who we are. We've created this. This is our civilization. But obviously, the, the temples, the administrative build, buildings, we've got an idea of administration. It's not just about the poor and the rich. It's about how it all worked alongside the private houses, the, the, the royal palaces, the, the, the private graves. Um, and his excavations revealed more about Ur than, than we know of most other Mesopotamian cities. You know, we look at Ur and this would, this is much more than we know about Nimrud, um, Sesiphon, Nineveh, and if you want to go over to um, Syria, much more than Palmyra, that type of landscape. Perhaps no excavations in more than 150 years of archaeological work in Mesopotamia has excited as much public attention of Woolley's work at ancient Ur in the 20s and the 30s. You know, now we get excited with the fact that um, Islamic State didn't blow up a monument. You know, um, do you know what I mean? That this is what they were excited about in the 1920s and 30s was regular press reports. This was the internet of the day. This, this was... Yeah, this was regular telegrams. He would write his telegrams in Latin so that the telegram receiver in London wouldn't be able to read it. And, and then they would, it would be marked for, um, for the London news, the illustrated London news. And, and the um, telegraph dispatcher would run to uh, the um, illustrated London news and it'd be used, that, if it was early enough, it'd be used that day. You know, instant reports about the excavations. But everyone was doing it, you know, um, there was Tutism as well from Egypt. So he was having to compete with the discovery of Tutankhamun. And then he was having to compete with Sir Mortimer Wheeler, you know. And Gordon Child, Child has found a little little um, village of m mini people in, in Orkney. You know, this, this was the age of news in archaeology. But this is not just the news of archaeology from the view of British archaeologists. Um, there's a lot going out there, lots of other nations finding things. The Germans are excavating quite extensively in Germany, in, in Greece, actually. Um, the, one thing that, um, the one thing that Gordon Child and Woolley would do would be to try and link these things in with the past. And, and what Woolley was doing, he, was, he wished to see that there was a link with um, Ur and the Bible. Um, and obviously, you know, we're still very, very religious country in the, in the 1920s and 1930s. Look at golf. He's very religious today. He goes to church every Sunday. Um, and um, when, when, we, when, he's, um, when he's reporting, he's saying, this is linked to the Bible. This is linked to Abraham. This is, uh, this is actually linked to the Great Flood. You know, there's some link in there. Was the Garden of Eden underneath Ur, that type of thing? I don't think he said that at all, but, you know, oh, that type of landscape. Definitely, he's got prehistoric. He's got a prehistoric landscape there. He could, he could claim that, you know, it's way back. Um, so this, the great rival of, of archaeologists back then, and, and, and this was the thing, you see. So, um, some of these, um, some of the discoveries, the, the richly furnished discoveries, had to be reported in secret because when you think about it you know he's, he's excavating over 2600 burials right um, and most of them he's individually doing the work himself so the, these workers are going down and saying woolly pal um we've got a burial yeah and he comes over and he excavates it um so when you think about it every single Every report he's putting in, not every report, report but, you know, uh, numbers of the reports he's putting into the newspapers, he's found a new burial, which has um, a woman with a, a, a golden headdress on, a queen with a golden headdress on, surrounded by golden objects. And at the same time, Howard Carter's having to compete with that. Oh, my God, what am I going to find today? Right, OK. Um, let's, let's get an Anubis with a bit of gold on it. You know, that, that could trump this. So there was this competition. Um, so... This was, a, this, was, this was an archaeological excavation that was actively reported. Everyone knew about it. And at the same time, then, then you've got other excavations at Silchester, the great archaeological excavations in our country at Silchester. And people are reading, well, you know, what are they find at Silchester? A wonderful Roman mosaic. And in comes a report from Arthur Evans from, um, from Crete saying, look at what I found. 
And what happened was that the publicity that Woolley had meant that his work could be funded. You know, uh, for this 12 years, it could be funded continually for 12 years. Remember, the wages alone would be a massive drain. Um, and there's, if we think about the publicity, European tourists would flood to the site, and you've got the Ag Agatha Christie link in there as well. They flocked to this site, but, but the most important thing about this story, ignore the Western bit, um, the one thing is the Iraqis are actually linked to their past. Um, the workforce was an Iraqi workforce. And I've mentioned this before, there were active, qualified Iraqi archaeologists at this time working in Iraq. They were working on their own history. Um, and I'm going to be very careful with what I'm about to say. Um, <coughs> one, one of my biggest problems um, you know, when we get these marches and we know what we're talking about, people saying these lives matter and those lives matter and all the rest of it. I like to think that we've, we've got such a cosmopolitan history that everyone's lives matter. I think I've just got away with that. Um, and what we're saying here with these Iraqis um, is that they are actually, even though you get these professional Westerners excavating, these are the ones who are actually looking at their history for the first time. These are the ones who are actually also holding the artifacts. As Leonard Woolley is excavating, he's handing the archaeologists to Iraqis. So therefore, when you look at the Baghdad Museum, this is why the Iraqis said, no, we want all our artifacts back after the, the Iraq, Iraqi wars. It's our history. This is our identity. We want it back. And, and in many ways, when you look at the Islamic State to what the Islamic State was doing to the archaeology back a few years ago, the Iraqis were saying, we're not having this. This is our history. Don't care what the Americans or the British are saying. I know you want us to protect this, but we are going to protect this. And this is why so much of the archaeology wasn't destroyed and why we've got these great displays, because they admire their history. They want to be part of their history because it's their history. So um, with the closure of the excavations in 1934, it was probably a good thing. And you know what? That, in that image, he looks like um, King Edward, doesn't he? <laughs> yes. I knew King Edward well. It was me, <laughs> Wallace Simpson, and King Edward. There you go. So the artifacts recorded um, um, and all the records ended up being divided amongst Baghdad, London, and Philadelphia. Because they're, so you look at Baghdad, we've got quite a lot of stuff in the British Museum and in the Philadelphia Museum in the United States as well. The excavation of Ur was conducted in a period of great importance. As I've mentioned, this was a landscape being created by the archaeologist um, Gertrude Bell. So we look, we've already seen this image and we've already seen this one, but looking down, this is an aerial view of the excavations. Um, and I'm not sure which point in time the excavation, this is being excavated, but there's the great ziggurat. And you can just about see a wall going around the outside and all these little buildings, all these streets. Now this, um, I'm not sure where we're at in this, but um, this is only a quarter of the city excavated eventually. And then from um, the urban area that stretches all the way more or less to uh, the river, well, it does run to the river, that's what we're told. Um, the urban area probably exceeds about 10 kilometers in length. So you can imagine this area, this is a quarter of the actual city that's excavated, but the rest of the area is vast. Um, and why the city collapsed? Well, we're not gonna do that today because I, I can't really give you an answer. I've actually got this book by Leonard Woolley, um, and I know, I know Kathy's got a copy, um, Digging Up the Past by Sir Leonard Woolley, Charles Leonard Woolley. And to be honest with you, what I would say after this lecture is go on Amazon, you can pick these, these little books up um, for two or three pounds each, it's well worth it. And there is King Edward. No, that, that's uh, Leonard Woolley excavating. Um, and you can imagine that, that, that wonderful figure um, that he's excavating there, that wonderful terracotta figure um, in all the muds, seeing an archaeologist that time getting down and dirty. Do you know what, right? 
I can't remember many images of Gordon Child actually on his hands and knees excavating at Scarabray. I've not really seen an image of Sir Mortimer Wheeler excavating on his hands and his knees, but this guy is getting himself dirty every single day excavating at the site. I'll give him that respect. Love the guy and love his work. And look at that. Look at that golden. Now, we've had a discussion with this. That looks like a goat to me. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. Yeah. And, and then there's a discussion. It's a bull. But we'll go with the goat. I know my goats. There I was yesterday lying with Llewellyn and Gruffydd whilst they nibbled at my trousers. Uh, yeah, I had, I had apples in both my pockets. That's why. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but anyway... <laughs> But anyway, this, this itself is beautiful. And one thing I've decided not one thing I've decided against today is just showing you a load of images of gold statuary because it would have just been the lecture. So I decided not to do that. So within within all these public buildings and ziggurats, um, the temple tower, um, across the um, Sumerian landscape, the ziggurat itself um, at Ur. Um, we, we start to sort of link in this whole, um, this whole backstory uh, with the stories of the day, you know, the, the Bible and so on. Uh, Woolley determined that the ziggurat and other public buildings were located within an enclosure or temenos. Temenos is the Latin word um, that's used for an enclosure wall around the temple. Um, and then it said that um, outside this temenos, um, they had these gateways and then the town expanded and lots of changes occurred. And we've got it. We've got various bits of research to actually look at that um, with what he's telling us about the various changes. So the private houses, which, which I've mentioned, and again, a little bit about the private houses. While Woolley excavated sig significant public buildings, he also made uniquely important discoveries about Ur's private houses. I think that word uniquely important discoveries, because nobody was working on the, the common stuff. People just weren't doing it. It was not the thing to do. Now, if he, if he had just concentrated on all the big public buildings, we'd have all these big public buildings, but no, none of the evidence of the people actually built these big public buildings, except the graves. And we'd think, well, where did these people live? You know, did they... And, and, and so what he did, um, he did excavate everything in that quarter of the city. The best preserved private houses he discovered uh, dated to around 3,500 years ago. Uh, because obviously, as the city's developing, these houses are moving into all those spaces that the city moves around and gets bigger and bigger. Um, now, there's a few in... If I, if I read this out, and it'd be probably best if I read this out in full. Houses at Ur generally lay along winding streets and alleyways rather than a squared city grid that you'd see in a Roman city. The floors of these houses were typically much lower than street level, up to a metre lower, because rubbish and dirt accumulated so quickly in the streets. So obviously you've got to continually move the level of your front door to match the level of the street. That's what he's saying. I'm not going to disagree with that or analyze it either. Woolley noted an interesting detail where streets met. The corner of buildings were usually rounded. And he suggested this was to prevent pack mules from catching their loads on edges and knocking their wares into the street. Many crossroads also had a small public shrine or chapel. So this was, this was a very highly religious community, very similar to the communities in ancient Egypt. There's nothing different about that. As well as houses within the city, Woolley also found houses, house remains outside the city walls, which I've mentioned, scattered all the way to Tal al Abud, which is six kilometers to the southwest. That's the one side of the city. And then you've got the other side of the city and the side of the city itself. So you've got about 10 kilometers. Even in ancient times, suburban sprawl seems to have been a phenomenon associated with major cities, but not in Britain. We don't have that evidence in Britain. So where we're looking at the, where we're looking at the fineries and, you know, their pottery. Do you know, in the publications, um, and I know Jim's going to turn around to say he's got a full set of uh, Leonard Woolley's publications, but in the publications, you've got all his own photographs and they're really sharp. 
and really intriguing. These are all glass. These are all going to be glass plates. This is actually on a glass plate. Um, so the rejected glass plates, I wonder where they went. Because um, when we look at the house of um, Howard Carter in Egypt, he left behind all the non-used glass slides. Um, and the archaeologists have been excavating and saying, oh my God, look at this glass slide. There's something in this glass slide that we didn't know. So where's the rejected glass slides? We've got 2,000 that he kept. That would be an interesting excavation. Very interesting. It's unlikely they would have been reused either because of the acids and all the rest of it. Um, there he is again. Um, and a few things that you can see, obviously we've mentioned he's excavating there. You can see that there's some detail about the mud brick. You can actually see the mud bricks being used as paving. So this is paved with mud bricks. Um, and whether they're sun-baked or um, kiln-baked, the, 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 the mud bricks there. Um, so what we're really slowly understanding is that actually it's starting to get up into the face of this archaeology. And, and this is actually excavating the ziggurat. So you can see the, the, the work gang there. Um, and obviously, um, when they get down to the level, the archaeologists are actually working there. And there's, there's Ellen at the top there. Um, giving somebody a lecture about holding a shovel wrongly. Um, and again, these are all the common houses against um, the ziggurat walls. Um, actually, I don't know. I think this is actually the, the Temenos wall um, around the ziggurat. This is why we've got the common houses. I think that's a better interpretation. Um, Ur excavations. So these books from the 1930s are so bloody wonderful because, because they're what an archaeological publication should be. Um, you, 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 you've got, um, and, and, and what an archaeological publication should be is just images on the right hand side plates, because the other one is a, is a text. So what you would do, you would look at the text and say, this, this image, um, plate 556, and you would go to the plates book and you would turn, so you've got the text and you've got the plates, it's great. So it's brilliant, isn't it? So you can just have a book of images, the type of thing that Keith would love, because Keith can't read. Mm. Certainly. So, so obviously, when we're looking at the royal tombs themselves, um, the Ur excavations are a remarkable story. For all, everything that we've mentioned, finding the burial ground as well. This is rather interesting, this point as well. In the late 1920s, Woolley uncovered a cemetery uh, with as many as 2,000 burials spread over an area approximately of 70 by 55 metres. So it's quite a really small burial area. And then you've got another 660 associated with the Royal Cemetery. So you've got Common Cemetery, Royal Cemetery, and this is only a very small... This is all under all that crap. So this is not under the surface. A metal detect enthusiast couldn't metal detect 15 metres below the surface. This is way down there. So to actually get way down there on those levels. Remember what we said earlier on? The, the, burials, um, the, the burials themselves uh, are built above the uh, prehistoric layers um, from 7,000 years ago. And then you've got this sort of big flood layer across it. A biblical flood layer, say, in Woolley's word. And then what you've got, you've got garbage and the burials are placed into that garbage. The Royal, Royal Cemetery and uh, the, the domestic cemetery. But all of that is, is you know, 10, 15 metres below the surface. Um, so, so again, what, 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 we're seeing, what we're seeing as well is that um, Woolley, uh, Woolley did see that these royal burials just stood apart from, from, from the others. Um, there were 16 really important um, royal burials. You know, the 16, out of the 660, there were sort of sub-princes and, you know, aristocrats and stuff. But they actually found 16 burials of the leaders, which is really important. And, and obviously, we're understanding the burials because we've actually got their names in the cuneiform in front of you. That, that, you know, the names, that's the alphabet there. Um, and we do, we are able to read the cuneiform script. That is a cuneiform script in clay, um, sun blake clay. So obviously... You know, Keith, um, I hope you've made a record of this. Uh, put it outside to dry, not in the rain. And when you've finished, 
pack mule to my house and I'll send it as notes out to everybody, right? So, um, <laughs> of course. I don't know. Yeah, there, there would be a, actually there would be a way of um, of, of printing this if you get a, 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 a direct mold of that and whatever you know what I mean. But anyway, so th this is there are tens of thousands of these records across the, the whole landscape. You know, the, the whole landscape of Mesopotamia. Hun t tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and these are really starting to be examined in the 1870s by a, an Iraqi, by an Iraqi expert. You know, we don't talk about all. We, all we've been doing in these lectures is talking about mainly Western archaeological excavations um, and Western thinking. What well, that will change in in after next week. We'll be doing something very different, um, and that is it carved into stone. You made a mistake there. You made a spelling mistake, Keith. You're going to have to start the game. Oh, no. Exactly. You, you spelt uh, Tricky Dicky's name wrong. <laughs> and this itself is where we go next. So that is, we've already seen this, but we did it um, lightly with, with squinted eyes. Actually, you can think of this. You can go to ancient Egypt and you can actually think about the um, great chambers of the kings and the queens and they sort of go down these steps, right? This is not much different, but there's no, there's no great bloody um, pyramids above these things. So the year excavations are a remarkable story. Um, these royal tombs consisted of vaulted or domed stone chambers. When we say domed, corbel domed or vaulted um, because we don't have the arch. Um, the principal body lay in the chamber, naturally buried with substantial quantities of goods and other um, of, um, precious, pre semi-precious stones, precious stones, gold, silver, um, sometimes including the sledge or wheeled vehicle pulled by oxen um, or goats. There you go. Um, personal and household attendants lay in the tomb chamber with the deceased king or queen and in the pit outside so there's various different arrangements for these 16 burials the death pits now when when i as you know i've done this lecture a number of times this week um and this next passage i've not read out because um i i didn't I, I couldn't grasp it from a presenting point of view. So if I read this next paragraph out as a little bit of a story, close your eyes, you might be able to understand what Woolley's description is in regards to the death pit and what was going on. If you don't understand it, then it's fine. So Woolley imagined what had happened after the deaths of Ur's kings and queens as follows, 16 of them in different localities. Let's see if I can do this. We must imagine the burial in the chamber to be complete and the door sealed. There remains the open pit with its matte lined walls and matte covered floor, empty and unfurnished. Now, down the sloping passage comes a procession of people, the members of the court, soldiers, men servants and women, the latter in all their finery of brightly coloured garments and headdresses of lapis lazuli and silver and gold. And with them musicians bearing harps or lyres, cymbals. They take up their positions in the farther part of the pit. And then they are driven or backed down the slope. The chariots drawn by oxen or by asses. The drivers in the cars the grooms holding the heads of the draft animals, and these two are marshalled into the pit. Each man and woman brought a little cup of clay or stone or metal, the only equipment required for the rite that was to follow. Some kind of service there must have been at the bottom of the shaft. At least it is evident that the musicians played up to the last and that each drank from the cup. Either they brought the potion with them or they found it prepared for them on the spot. At one of the locations, PG1237, wherever that is folks, interjection, there was in the middle of the pit a great copper pot into which they could have dipped or they composed themselves, uh, start again, and they composed themselves for death. So they dipped their cup in there and they got themselves ready for death. Then someone came down and killed the animals and perhaps 
arranged the drug bodies and when that was done earth was flung from above on them and the filling in of the grave shaft was begun so they poisoned them all um and that that's basically from woolly the royal um cemetery or excavations somebody asked if they were buried alive well whatever poison they had knocked them out that was it um there's no there's no evidence that they struggled or tried to move around or escape they just died and and when you think about this you think well um why but then what what have we what what right do we have to question why they did this um if the answer is that they felt life was better in the afterlife than than on the planet maybe that's a good reason but from an object, objective point of view, not from a modern point of view, I feel that that is a great deal of resources lost. Um, not only are they losing a large amount of their wealth through burial, they're losing large numbers of their, um, their, their foodstuffs, the animals and, and their, their people, but they still went ahead and did it. Um, and the only hope is that they felt that they were going to a better life than the life that they lived. And then that's trying to be objective many mysteries about the royal tombs and death pits remained did the ritual happen as woolly imagined or did royal attendants go to their deaths less willingly why do some death pits include only a handful of bodies while others contain far more like the 73 retainers five women and 68 men in the death pit so there we are. We're looking now at this landscape of burial. There's, there's loads there. And, and this is that higgledy, that image that we saw earlier on. Now, now they're all dead. Um, it's carnage. It's, um, maybe, maybe, maybe one or two of them survived. I don't know. But, you know, not all of these poisons and not all of them would have thought who would have been watching them drink? You know all those questions. And again, more of these, um, more of these common houses. So as we come to the end now, some of the royal tombs uncovered by Woolley had been partly destroyed, probably when later tombs were dug. Nearly all of the royal tombs had been robbed in antiquity, but they were still full of riches. Queen Poiboy, um, um, Woolley said. Um, she was found with a fabulous golden headdress and burial attire beaded with semi-precious stones. Mm. Woolley's finds were so incredible, so rich, that he wrote telegrams to the <coughs> British Museum um, announcing these spectacular finds on a regular basis. The excavation of these royal tombs was no easy task. The soil into which the tombs were cut was composed of dumped rubbish, which was not only soft and unstable, but also acidic and highly um, um, salinated, with the result that it ate away at skeletal remains and other things survived. Because, you know, as we saw with bog bodies, it's very acidic. It, it could, it, you, your flesh remains, but the bones go. So different soils destroy different artifacts and other artifacts survive. Woolley's recovery of artifacts from the cemetery's royal tombs still stand as an extraordinary technical achievement with the levels of preservation. Um, that, that were offered when he was actually when he was actually seeing these finds. I've just got two messages coming in. Um, Jane has to go. Um, see you next week, she says. And Pam has to go. See you next week. Well, we've nearly finished, folks. Thanks for those messages. Um, and he worked alongside his wife, um, Catherine. So we've got to mention Catherine. Um, so again, these normal domestic buildings. So as we sort of that, that's actually the last image. Thank God for that. So really, really, we've come through um, everything that we needed to do today and all the images that we needed to do today. Um, and obviously the cemeteries and, and the buildings and obviously the prehistoric um, layers as well. Um, and just, just another last paragraph, which I'm not going to mess around with. In the, in the excavation season from 1928 to 1929, after Woolley had excavated part of the cemetery to a depth of 13 meters, Woolley decided to dig through that layer below the floor levels of the excavated burials. He made a startling discovery, a thick layer of water laid silt indicative of flooding on top of a layer containing characteristic black painted pottery 
um, the earliest phase of occupation on the southern Mesopotamian floodplain with the evidence of the buildings. What did this mean? In some of his publications, Woolley connected this deep layer of silt to the biblical flood, which may also be alluded to in the Sumerian king list, which is a list of um, records detailing what's going on. So in other words, the Bible tells us there was a great flood. Gilgamesh tells us a great flood. Also, the Sumerian king list tells us a great flood. It could, there could have been a great flood. There could have been both rivers euphrates and tigris could have flooded at the same time there could have been a tidal wave of some um magnitude flooded the entire landscape that's possible we've seen it we've seen it and it's possible and the water may not have abated for a whole year so i'm not going to dismiss anything I'll, all i can say lots of what is written in the old testament is 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 not not to excuse a pun is gospel we, we're actually seeing that lots of the old testament is is real um and, um, and, and then what we do see is that, obviously, with the ending of these excavations in 1934, finding everything that he did find, telling us everything that he did offer us, um, it was a nice um, close to the chapter of excavations in 1934. And what we're going to do, um, we're now going to open up, we've gone run over slightly today, but what I'm going to do now um is we're going to stop sharing anyone like to say anything um uh, ellen try and keep it brief darling right um only a few things right in um peru in the mountains they used to give the children poison you know those children that were found as sacrifices for yes. the, the good of the future yes and um, it could be that the number of people in the burials depended on the size of the household so perhaps the entire house household was killed when the the person in charge died or something. All I can say is a lot of women going along with it. Go on, carry on, Ellen. Yeah, well, if it was the if it was the working household. Yeah. You know, all your servants and your your workers. They would mainly be women. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would mainly be men. That's right. Yeah. Go on. Those ones with gated houses was that to prevent burglary and vandalism, or just to sort of deem demarcation no, de de demarcation to be honest with you the the idea of robbery and theft is is more of a modern concept because our houses yeah. are full of stuff these days so you know it's 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 a different way of looking at things and finally ellen because we we, we got to crack on just one more question well that's it thank you very oh. much that was lovely it was brilliant thank you hopefully see you tonight as well ellen um and goff anything you'd like to say no no question thank you for that goff it was very interesting thank you very much my pleasure, my pleasure, always. And um, Chris, anything? Um, and you found Chris? all over the site. What's that? Was the cuneiform writing found all over the site, or was it just in the ziggurat in the administrative bit? <laughs> now that's a question that I'm not going to answer because it would be very. No, I'm not going to answer that question because I, 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 the context of change over time. You might say of a temple, and then it's been ruined, and then houses are put on top. But you're still going to get that cuneiform associated with the houses. So I, I would say all over the site, that's a clear answer, okay. but it doesn't necessarily relate to what the archaeology was back then. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this morning at nine o'clock on Radio 4 was a program about the Neanderthals and um, their artistry and writing. And that will be repeated. So if you go on BBC Radio 4 um, Sound, you'll be able to listen to that. And I'm sure Goff would have listened to that this morning. I missed it. Thanks for that, Ellen. Um, Keith? No, I'm just surprised I knew so little about or, uh, uh, compared with, you know, Tutankhamun, considering they're contemporary and uh, ah. Howard Carter doing that. You know, yeah. it's surprising to me that it's not so well known. That, that, it, that is actually a really good point. There's me going on that they, they competed, but the, the news that we do hear is about Tutankhamun, not these excavations, not Arthur Evans' excavations. And that, that's, a re, that's a really powerful point. And the question is, it was so reported back in the day, but we don't have that now. That, that's a very important point. In, very, yeah, there is, there is. Um, what I'm going to do, okay, guys in... Um, I've asked to unmute in wherever you are. Go on. Everyone speak through that camera Everyone and then we'll call it a day. Please Any don't wear a green top again because you keep disappearing.
I got to be honest with you, Sarah. Well, I got to be honest with you, uh, Kathy. What your relationship is with, with me and what you want to see on my person is between you and me, right? I know you want to see my full body, but you don't have to talk about it. I'm not sure the ghostly head and hands would does you justice. <laughs> I think it does me wonderful justice. Look at Chris, she's really happy with the Plus presentation. Uh, anything else quickly before we close it? No? Yes. Why, I want to be more modern. Yeah, shut up. Shut up about the Phantom of the Opera. Right, Jim, you've got the last question. Okay, so why haven't they sort of um, done more recent digs on the site if such a large area exists underground still? Um, the fact, the fact, of the matter is, the um, we've got all the we've got all the illegal invasions of Iraq for a start. Um, and, <laughs> <Hey>! <laughs> um, and you think, Carol, how many times you mention it? <laughs> exactly, and you the basically be, be, the the thing is, I, I think the Iraqis have been very sensible. They've got the information that they need, um, and excavation on that uh, that scale would be very expensive if you've got a scale on that if you've got an excavation on that scale today you, you're talking about the, the price tag would be millions and millions and um it, it's not it, it's not economically valuable uh, viable we got so much from her i tell you what right the answer to this question is this and we'll end on this right if if i if i started off at 18 right and i just studied the site of Ur, right at this stage of my life, I'd still not know uh, enough to be comprehensive with a lecture about her because the amount of information given from those excavations is, is, is vast. <coughs> and I wouldn't have been able to see all the artifacts either. So if we've got nothing else from um, you guys, Andrea, Andrea, when can you call me later? Um, anytime after five. Yeah, I tell you what, call me, call me at six o'clock, okay? I'll do my best. I need to talk to you about two things. If not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this a day now. Really appreciate um, Jane and uh, Pam with us as well. Ellen, Goff, see you all tonight who's come in. Chris, Andrea, um, Kathy, Jim, um, Karen and Keith. See you guys and thanks. Bye bye, Daddy. Bye bye, Daddy. To our children. <laughs> my children. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye guys. <laughs> Guys, that's why that, that's my feeling after a lecture. Oh, bye bye. She, why it doesn't matter wearing a green top, it's a good green top. What the what those people were left. What do you think about my green top? Anyway, thank you very much for watching this. Um, Carl James Langford, Archaeology Camry, over.